Hello everybody, we are NSFRE researchers for Lawrence Technological University and Michigan State University and today we are going to present our Vehicle to Everything communication project. Before I get into things, I want to go through a quick overview of what we'll be talking about today. First, we're going to go through the motivation, which is why we want vehicles communicating to each other on the road. Then a little background of what's already been done in the field of uh, vehicle communication. Then we're going to talk about our objectives, which were our goals for the program along with our experimental setup, the tools we pro were provided to accomplish these goals, and then of course we'll go into methods and our future work. So imagine you're in the scenario, you're driving at night in the, in the rain and visibility's poor, all of a sudden you see the car in front of you turn on its hazards. You're getting a message from this car, but you don't really know exactly what it is. There are many possibilities. For example, the driver could be having a mechanical problem and need to pull over soon, or Possibly the driver um, just can't see that well and wants to make his car more visible. Or maybe he just accidentally pressed the button and he's not even trying to send a message at all. So this, although the cars are communicating or the drivers are communicating via a message, the message is very ambiguous and you don't really know what's going on. This is the goal that Vehicle to Everything is trying to accomplish. In V2X, we have, we have cars uh, com uh, coming in close to each other um, and relaying messages almost instantaneously. Rather than the hazards, the messages are not up to interpretation. They're specific messages warning about possible hazardous conditions, possible pedestrians near the roadway to, uh, that it needs to warn about, potholes, um, all of the above, that get sent almost instantaneously and, not as, and is not left up to interpretation. So let, uh, going off of that, let's talk about the goals of V2X. So first, of course, we want to improve safety. The average human reaction time is three-fourths of a second. And for all of you guys driving on the road, you know it is often longer than that because people are distracted by their phone, by conversations, by loud music, etc. So the, the benefit of having com computers communicate is it's nearly instant. Rather than talking about seconds, we're talking about uh, milliseconds um, that it takes to communicate. Also, they get to send specific messages um, communicating hazards, pedestrians, poor weather conditions, and more. So the, the broadness of what you can communicate increases drastically when it goes to computers rather than relying on vague signals such as hazards, flashing beams, etc. Also we want to move more efficiently. With vehicle communication we can optimize intersections leading to less times that, car, that cars are spending idly just sitting at red lights. Also, we can harmonize speed to allow vehicles to follow each other more closely. This can lead to vehicles getting to their destinations faster, spending less time in traffic, um, and just a more efficient roadway system in general. And then these two points also help reduce fuel emissions um, because you have people arriving to their destination more efficiently, less time idle, uh, just sitting there um, with the exhaust running you have less time idly, you're just spending more time driving, and that is great for our environment and overall health. So let's talk about our current state of V2X. First, we have vehicle ad hoc networks, which provide internet access and connectivity between vehicles. Uh, they're being researched to prevent collisions, dynamically scheduled routes, and monitor conditions. So pretty much very similar to the goals we're trying to accomplish, it increases vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle connectivity via, um, via a uh, network. Second, we have vehicle infrastructure integration, and you guys m might be more familiar with these. First, we have siren sensors. If y'all have ever been sitting at a light, and all of a sudden you see an ambulance or an emergency vehicle come through, and then their light all of a sudden turns green, that's an example of most likely a siren sensor on the traffic light that is detecting the emergency vehicle sound or the flashing lights. Uh, to let um, these important vehicles access their locations faster. Also, we have roadside units, which is what we're personally using in our, um, in, uh, during our research. These allow um, vehicles to dynamically connect to um, networks and communicate with each other. Next, you have weather sensors, which can warn about severe weather conditions if a road is in inaccessible due to flooding or some other, um, or some other weather conditions. It can warn drivers of that. Of course, we have traffic detection, which can scan the roads 
to see where traffic jams are and let drivers know in order to disperse traffic more, more evenly across the city. And of course, license plate recognition, which is used by uh, entities such as police officers and toll booths to easily recognize vehicles. All right, so now we're going to get into our research for the summer. Our primary objectives were, first of all, to create connections between vehicles. This is the bread and butter of V2X. Without connections between vehicles, you can't communicate any of the, any of the um, warnings that we want to communicate. Next, we're trying to map real-time vehicle locations via web GUI. This is live updating and just and shows every vehicle that's connected to the roadway or connected to the network. And then finally, we want to create occupancy grid, which occupancy grids, which also map live vehicle locations, but also does some trajectory prediction and possible collision det detection. So now, um, following up on that, we're going to talk about the tools that we use to um, um, to solve these problems. First, we were provided with two Polaris Gen vehicles equipped with a makeup makeup camera and a drive-by-wire system. These vehicles. Um, the drive-by-wire system in these vehicles allow us to connect to them via a computer and run programs that uh, send messages to drive the, the car by itself and also receive messages on velocity, steering report, etc. any information you need to know. Also, our roadside unit is simply a Raspberry Pi connected to a battery and also connected to an antenna, which creates a roadside unit network that vehicles can connect to and relay messages. So now we're going to get into time position navigation, which is the first aspect of, of our V2X project. In this, in, this, um, in this note, we use C++ and ROS. ROS is robot operating system. That's how we're running the cars in general and sending messages and, getting, and receiving messages from the vehicle. So let's go through the, the GPS system. We use Swift navigation. We have two Swift Pixie multi-receivers. These are global navigation system. Um, these are global navigation uh, satellite system receivers that have many capabilities. Such as they can receive many different satellite constellations, such as GLONASS, and what, most importantly for us, it receives GPS, and that's what we're, we'll be using. Also, has RTK capabilities, which uh, which can use a, a roadside GPS unit to get a get a very precise location. Um, also has many different positioning formats, such as, such as ECEF, UTM, LTP, and LLH. Uh, we're going to be using LLH, which stands for Latitude, Longitude, and Heading. We have two receivers, which is important um, because it allows us to get heading values to show where the vehicles are, are, what direction they're facing relative to true north. And of course, they're ROS compatible, allowing them to communicate with our nodes and communicate with the vehicles. So in order to get, uh, consolidate all the information we need, we've created a TPN node, standing for time position navigation. Uh, here we just subscribe to the latitude, longitude, and heading topic, along with drive -by the drive-by-wire system. And we consolidate um, a custom position message containing latitude, longitude, heading, velocity, and angular z. We chose, we chose all of these um, attributes because they give us all the information we need to know about where a vehicle is right now and the general direction it's heading, which allows for live map, map updates and also future location prediction, which uh, my coworkers will talk about later. Now Mike's gonna talk about object detection. So imagine the situation that Luke was describing earlier, where you have a vehicle driving and there's another vehicle that's flashing its lights and you don't really know why it's doing so. One possibility is that it's encountered an object and it wants to communicate that information to you. So in order to do object detection in our RU, we use C++ to create a custom message type, as well as ROS and Python. So first, we did several laps around the track, placing cones sporadically, and we collected 300 images with cones, as well as 100 images without cones. Then we put these images into RoboFlow, which is a data collection software, as well as a data creation software. We were able to label these images, indicating where the cones were, and then 
We use Robofo to create a 70%, 15%, 15% split for training, validation, and testing data. Then the actual training happened in YOLO, which is a classic model that's used for object detection using deep learning. And as you can see here, we can detect a cone with 90% confidence, which is pretty good. Additionally, this is what the custom message type looks like. Here you can see that it's detecting a cone with 90% confidence, and it's drawing the box. And these are the parameters which indicate what the box is going to look like in the image. As you can see, this even works in the rain, and we recently saw that it works at night as well. Next, we've collected information about time position navigation, and we've collected information about objects that are on the roadway, and we want to consolidate that information inside of a database. So in order to do this, we use ROS, Python, and MariaDB. We created a database which had two tables. The first being a client vehicle table, which stores information about latitude, longitude, heading, speed, and angular z velocity. We also created an identified objects table. This stores information about latitude, longitude, type, and time of detection. We store the 30 most recent objects in this database, but we can expand to store 100 or 200 objects depending on the circumstance that is necessitated. Additionally, we configured the database so that we could use a remote host. We could connect any computer to the database and access the information over the same network. This is what the table looks like in an HTML browser with two vehicles, Actor 1 and Actor 2, the Polaris gems that Luke introduced earlier, and with two cones and the pedestrian. We manually inputted the pedestrian because for now we only have cone detection. And now show me what we'll be talking about web GUI. published using C++ and ROS that we have inserted using Python and that we have stored in the Maria database. All of this data is only known by the programmers as such, but until it, until it is able to be seen, it is intangible. And for anybody outside of the programming development team, it is unknown. So in order to, and the unknown is always scary, so in order to relieve some of that fear and anxiety that may come with with unknown technologies, we have created a web GUI, a graphic user interface using Node.js and HTML to be able to develop and host a web server that will, um, that will plot and display the markers, as you will see. And we have also used Socket.io and API to be able to allow live updating because a static map does nothing for dynamically moving vehicles we need to be able to live update it with all of the information that cars and vehicles may see at different points as they are driving along the road. So Socket IO allows for um, live updating of all of this information. And finally, we use the Google Maps API in order to plot all of our information on a map with different colored markers. So as I mentioned before, we use Node.js to develop a server which allows us to plot and display markers on a Google Maps API that shows the map of the LTU campus. This takes information from the Maria database and using Socket.io, it pulls information from that database from the two tables every 500 milliseconds or twice per second. And then we also verify all represented objects to ensure that they are actually there and filter it out accordingly. This represents the color coding of our GUI. So the blue marker represents the location of actor one. The green marker represents the position of actor two, which are the names of the two vehicles that we have been using in this project. And the orange represents the objects that we are detecting, in this case, traffic cones. 
As I mentioned before, it automatically updates based on information that it is receiving from the database. So this is just one snippet of the automatic updating where you can see Actor 1 being stored somewhere by a building, Actor 2 being somewhere in the parking lot, and the cone that they are both detecting and transmitting information from one another. And now Jack will continue talking about the occupancy grid. So what is an occupancy grid? An occupancy grid is much like the web GUI. It is used for visualizing data and for detecting collisions, especially at major intersections or busy roadways. Here we have a little GIF showing how it works. The vehicle is starting in one square and its trajectory and path is being predicted as it goes around the course. So occupancy grids are used in the real world to manage intersections, uh, plot vehicles connected to RSUs, roadside units, uh, predict their paths, and plot obstructions detected by other vehicles or uh, that's inputted, and to detect and avoid collisions. For our uh, occupancy grid, we decided to avoid collisions with velocity, by changing velocity, instead of predicting paths and changing paths. You can see that here in this picture, that we detect a collision in about 1.5 seconds, and we have actions for actor one to stop. How it works is vehicles are stored with a unique ID and they're updated on the map every time that they send updates to their time, position, and navigation node. Velocity and steering angle can be used to predict the data with a simple physics model such as the bicycle model, and collisions can be avoided by changing velocity as opposed to the uh, lateral deconfliction. Remote speed limit control, that's Matt, uh, Matthew. So as we've seen so far, a big part of VDAX is safety, and a big part of safety is not driving too fast. So we made a system designed to remotely limit uh, the speed of cars. Uh, it comes in two parts. There is a node that lives on the cross on the Raspberry Pi that broadcasts a speed limit to any cars connected nearby, and then there are nodes that live on the vehicles, and on the vehicles, uh, it takes in that information, takes in how fast the car is intending to go, and then uh, effectively limits the speed of the vehicle to that speed limit if it would go too fast. Uh, it has no effect if the car is going below said speed limit, uh, and it would just drive normally in that situation. Uh, this is designed for self-driving vehicles, but it is a system that could be easily modified to just raise a warning to the driver if uh, it was being manually driven at the time. Uh, looking at this more graphically, we can take the self-driving elements here, you know, they live on the vehicle and it gets past the firewall node of how fast it's intending to go, where it's intending to drive, and then on the Raspberry Pi, it will take a speed limit input, which is just simply an integer broadcast from the set of node. This firewall node can take both of those pieces of information, modify the speed as necessary, and then pass that to the actual driving system and let the car drive forward. So, moving on to future works for our project, uh, we did. We've done a lot, as you've seen, but there's still so much more to do. Uh, we haven't fully finished, finished uh, integration to our vehicles, so we need to finish up on that eventually. Uh, currently, this is designed around only one roadside unit, so we could expand it to a network of multiple roadside units and even more cars. Uh, our object detection currently only works on cones, so we definitely need to expand that uh, and possibly implement 2D LiDAR or 3D LiDAR to detect just obstacles in the road in general that didn't rely less on uh, pre-programmed detection, and also currently uh, when we detect an object, it only it remains in a buffer of 30 unique objects and we don't have any time-based removal set up. So we can implement time-based removal based off of the category of the object if we're able to identify it. Like a cone might only be relevant for a week or so and then the cone's gonna get removed because the construction's done. So it's no longer an element, uh, a relevant object to be planning on. Uh, as a whole, VDAX is working uh, to what we identified as three big things. One is going to be reducing traffic on highways because if we coordinate a bunch between vehicles, we should be able to uh, effectively either route around traffic and therefore make it alleviate faster or make traffic reduce as you reduce that springing effect that can travel through cars and cause traffic jams out of nothing. Uh, two is eventually we can hope to eliminate turn signals and traffic lights as cars 
communicate in between each other, uh, and this will help, again, get people where they're going faster and safer. And then three, uh, implement path scheduling with the occupancy grid or something similar to what Jack had just shown. And again, this is all looking forward to, we're trying to make cars safer, we're trying to make cars more efficient, we're trying to get you where you want to go faster. Uh, here are some references that we used when researching and some of the graphics that we used. And then that's all we got. Do you have any questions before we? So I'll 